It seems as though the meeting is just beginning, but the reality is it's coming to a close this evening. It always amazes me how fast the meeting progresses along, and presto, you seem as though it's over before it even began. We are very Christian. I want to extend my gratitude for the food, for the hospitality, for the good conversation, most of all for the fellowship and the gospel, and for the strong stand that this church here, congregation takes, the truth, and for all of the of the work that you all are involved in, we are thankful for your, your posture in the truth to stand for what is right. If you are a guest this evening, we are very delighted that you're here with us. And I always ask this question, is there anybody here that's never obeyed the gospel? I always ask some of the members, yeah, we have, we have some. Well, so during the course of this lesson tonight, since this is the last lesson, entitled, Let Us Rise Up and Build, from Nehemiah chapter 2, number 18. And while this lesson is not an exhaustive lesson designed to go verse by verse through Nehemiah, we're going to look at a few points, and we will apply to New Testament references from the Old Testament. We'll run the New Testament, and we'll make application. But the whole time this lesson is going forward, I want you to think. If you've never obeyed the gospel, don't wait for the invitation. That's too late. Start thinking right now. Do you want to be a part of the greatest kingdom ever known, the kingdom of God? Do you want to be a part of the us, which collectively here in typology would be to the application today, the church of our Lord? Don't you want to be a part of this fellowship? This blood-bought institution, Acts 20 and 28, that we together can serve God and make a difference in this world by the preaching of the gospel of Christ. That's really what we're doing all week, is preaching by divine declaration, God's eternal word, through human vessels. We are sounding out the trumpet so that all might be able to hear over social media and right here in Nesbitt, Mississippi, the pure gospel of Jesus. Now, you remember Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king, Nehemiah 1 and verse 11. But he was weeping and he was very overwhelmed in his soul because he had heard where Jerusalem lied, where the physical element really had a deeper meaning that the people of God were at a low. They were suffering. They were despondent and lethargic. They were at a distance from where they ought to have been spiritually. And this book of 13 chapters is an amazing book of leadership, and it tells us that we ought to be people of prayer. There's no way for us to rise up and build together unless we are a people dedicated to the theme of prayer. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. Before he ever went out to survey, before he ever went out to begin operations, before he ever went out to lead or to construct, he prayed to the God of heaven. Dear brothers and sisters tonight, I challenge all of us to be people of prayer. Mark 1 and 35, rising up a great while before daybreak and departing into a solitary place, there he prayed. Jesus was a man of prayer. We ought to pray always, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 tells us. And that's not saying that we verbally pray 24-7, but there is something here that is continual. The text tells us that. What is under consideration of continual? The mood of prayer, the mindset, the attitude, the heart of man being so conditioned that he lives in a state that's likened to, that would easily be able to yield itself to prayer at any time. We need to have that mindset as we live this earth. A Christian must be very careful. He cannot focus on building or rising up if his mind is so entangled with the affairs of the world that he lives in a state of turmoil, worry and anxiety and, and overwhelmed with things of this world, we must be, as Paul commanded us, we must seek those things which are above and not on this earth. That doesn't mean that we don't have concerns while we live on this earth. We know we do. But we need to take the higher road and think about eternal things the things which are eternal, 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, are the things that are not seen. And those things, young people, that are not seen are those things that we seek and that we, by faith, 
look for to and through the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There's no way that we can rise up and build unless, like Nehemiah, we are men and women of prayer. And prayer, prayer is the way in which we communicate to our Father. What type of relationship on earth would be anything at all without communication? When I first got married, I had to learn, really, how to communicate. <laughs> I thought I knew, but the way I was communicating was not the way my wife wanted to communicate. Sometimes she would say, I don't want to talk about it. Really, she was wanting a hug, but I didn't know that. Somebody tell me they don't want to talk about it, I'd go get a room. That wasn't the way to do it, you know? So we need to learn to communicate with our Father. So young people, think about these passages tonight that speak of being a people of prayer like Nehemiah, like Jesus. We cannot build anything for God unless it is dependent upon his divine will. If the Lord built not the house, we learned last night, what does the scripture say? Then all that labor, labor in vain. So let's build up the house of God, yes. Let's build up the local congregation of the glory of Christ. But let's do it on bended knee. Let's do it having a heart and a prayerful mindset to Jehovah God. Well, now we know from the Old Testament, which we learn from, Romans 15, 4, that Nehemiah, Nehemiah was a man of prayer, but he also was a man that was not only rational, but respectful of civil authorities. So he goes to the king, and he asks the king's permission to go out and to make a survey by night to see for himself what was actually the problem. Well, the problem was that he had heard that Jerusalem was in trouble. And again, the physical trouble in Jerusalem really was just the echo. It was just, it was just the the aftershocks of something that lied really deeper and more problematic at the heart of the problem was Israel's lack of spirituality. And tonight, all over our world, the churches of Christ need to wake up, pay attention. We need to rise up and build. Rise up and build. Not build the church. Jesus promised to build the church, not us. Matthew 16 and 18. But by the phrase build up, we mean Go to places where congregations are suffering, declined in spirituality and or number, and help to, re, to regenerate the growth there and to reinvigorate by a great spirit among our people, the human spirit, to reignite the flames of revival. That's what we need. So when Nehemiah goes out to survey, he sees there's a great problem. And he commissioned builders and through a very organized and detailed and thought of the plan after he's prayed to God, after he's got or has the king's permission, after the survey's been completed, he organizes people for the work. But you and I both know the devil does not like Christians to build. He does not like progress because when the church of our Lord in local places is making progress, people's souls are being saved, people are coming to Christ. Lives are being changed, families are being strengthened, children are being trained. Things are happening that's not in line with what Satan wants. Therefore, just like then, the same today, there's immediate opposition to anything that's good. All the young preachers ought to listen tonight. When you start local work, do not assume that everything is going to work out perfectly. While we have a good attitude and hope for the best, we also have to be prepared mentally that when we enter into the work of preaching, it's not always going to be rosy. There's going to be times your heart's going to be broken. There's going to be times that you have feelings of frustration, even disgust, with some of the things that are going on in the world, and even at times within the house of God. You have to learn how to deal with those things, or you will not be preaching in a few years to come. You have to realize, you have to realize that opposition is going to come. That's going to be that's going to be a given. The key is you have to learn how to handle opposition. Nehemiah tells us that. The Bible teaches that first and foremost, we never quit building even when opposition arounds us, surrounds us. Do you remember when they're building the wall, the half thereof, the people had a mind to work, and God is strengthening them? But Nehemiah, yes, he has men with bows and arrows fighting but they're also building the wall continuously. They never stop building. We 
We cannot afford to stop building. We must defend the gospel at all times. Paul said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. I think of the right tackle in football. His posture, he's set. He's down and ready, and he's in a position where it's not easy to knock over the tackle. Paul was in a position where the gospel could be defended. But Paul also advanced the cause through various missionary journeys and trips and travels in which he declared the gospel. Tonight, we must oppose all that is wrong. But we cannot afford to shrink back from advancing the cause because if we do that, we will die in numbers. So we must do both at the same time. Young people also know this over in Nehemiah. On one occasion, they come to Nehemiah and they ask him basically to come down the plains of Ono. They ask him to come down for what I call a little unity meeting. They ask him to come down to have a little discussion. But Nehemiah is a man of good discernment and judgment. We talked about judgment last night. Judge how? Righteously. John 7, 24. One of the greatest things a young preacher can have and to, to push for is a great spirit within himself of discernment. To be able to know when things when things at times simply are not worth your time and attention. You don't have to engage everybody, everywhere, every time. There's times in which wisdom would say the work that you are doing is more important than going over and, quote, wasting time with two or three guys who have nothing, who have nothing but ill will in them. And Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and his little gang of people had nothing but ill will towards Nehemiah and Israel as a whole. They had ridiculed. They had mocked. They had no good intentions. And so Nehemiah is not coming down to progress the wall. He's not stopping what he's doing to play their games. And therefore, this opposition is handled, in my opinion, masterfully by, ne by Nehemiah. And really, it's not my opinion. It's the Bible. So there. Amen? The Bible teaches us it's a masterful. This book teaches us about how to be leaders in God's God's kingdom. Well, let's go on further. Let us rise up and build. Now, tonight I want to talk a few things about local congregations. Just like Nehemiah, God strengthened his hands to build the wall back. The Bible said the people had a mind to work. Leaders have to figure out how to tap into the potential of all the people in the pews. Because if it's only the evangelists, second. Timothy 4, 5, if it's only the elders, Hebrews 13, 17, that are about to work, the work is not going to go very far. God intended, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that every member be active. So we have to figure out how, through this Old Testament teaching, how did Nehemiah spur the people on and encourage the people that everybody had a work? First and foremost, I remember when Rick and I was preaching down in Fort Worth trying to get people involved in the campaign. He was going to various places on Sunday evening speaking. When I was at one place, he'd be at another. I was at a particular congregation. This man said, one of the elders there, he said, when somebody obeys the gospel here, they are told immediately they have to find a place within the congregation to work. Everybody is expected to contribute. Not merely financially, but something within the local atmosphere of the congregation. Maybe it's sending out cards. Maybe it's mowing the church lawn. Maybe it's passing out tracts or organizing the library. But everybody had to have at least one area of work. That's biblical, brethren. Because if we're not working for God, we're going to be stagnating. And when we're in stagnation, we're going to cease. We're going to cease to be doing what we ought to do, which leaves a vacuum for things that are not right in this world. And therefore, one of the key elements is be busy. And I don't mean be busy for busy's sake. I mean be busy for Christ's sake, to advance his cause. So I have a question here this evening. Can everybody say, and some of you are here from Nesbitt, obviously, from most of you, but some of you are here from other congregations. <laughs> Is everybody here tonight that's in Christ's kingdom, a local congregation, are you invested in that local work? And if so, write down on a piece of paper, what are you contributing to the work yourself? Now, if that list is space and blank, don't beat yourself up too bad. But go ahead and change that 
and seek out some way to contribute to church beyond financial contributions. We've got to get every member plugged in. Because when every person's plugged in, they have skinned the game, they have now invested in the cost, and they feel much more in necessary items or the thought of being within the scope of needed. Therefore, they're less likely, they're much less likely to move away. Now, here's something else I was thinking about. This idea of us. Brethren, we need to teach the power of the collective body of Christ. We need the church much more than we realize. Nobody here tonight is the church. We are all members of the church, most of us. We collectively, together, but there's not one person that can say, I am the church. You are a member of the church. We think, we think sometimes that the local church ought to do everything that we think it ought to do. Sometimes people move into a community and they go from place to place. And they're, you know what they're doing? They're scouting out the congregations. They're trying to figure out which congregation has more youth programs. Which congregation maybe has the best looking minister. We all know that being Nesbitt right here in Mississippi. Brother Pope Joy. Some of the nicest buildings. I'm being serious. Over the course of time in preaching, I've heard it all as to why people place membership in places. Mm -hmm. Folks, let me tell you something. Your young people do not need to be coddled their entire life. There's nothing wrong with going to a smaller congregation and helping them to grow. Right? Sometimes we think, well, let us go to the largest congregation. And it's, no, let's go and build up. Let's engage. Let's do the family of sacrifices. Let's teach our young people there's a need. And in that need that we serve, we need to be about our Father's business. Hebrews 10 teaches us that we should let us, let us, let us. Three times that phrase is used. And ultimately, it's in reference to the heart of Christians collectively serving God. There is great power. There is great power and strength from fellowship in the church. The church is not a social club. Y'all hear me? The church is not a social club. But I'm afraid if we took some of the social mindsets out that some people would not be drawn. The drawing power to the local congregation should be at the ultimate end the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love that we have towards God, our fellow brethren, and the lost souls of humanity. That we would congregate and assemble to worship God and to organize ourselves to go out to the mission field which starts right here in our backyard. We send people all over the world to teach the gospel. But what about right here? Well, we need to rise up and build. I truly believe the days of the Church of Christ are bright in our future if we would simply heed the teaching from the book of Nehemiah on the importance of rising up and building. Now the Bible says in Nehemiah that people had a mind to work. What does that mean? It means they had a desire. They had a deep resolve, fortitude, to exercise the faith, not merely an operation of selfishness. It was not an operation of self-grandizement or instant gratification. They were serving them to accomplish something that was going to take a while. What we're doing today may not happen in 52 days. Like it did the walk, the half thereof. What we're doing today, the seeds that we're sowing may not take root for 10, 20, or 30 years. It may not be until after you're gone that those seeds take hold. But I'm here this evening to remind us that we need to help each other build up the local church. That's important. Tell me what else that means, brethren. And I'm going to stop. I'm going to sermon within a sermon. Now, that's why I didn't go to school. They're probably getting ahead. <laughs> One of the greatest problems that we have among our people is the love of the world. Materialism. 
Too much of the world has crept into church. How can we rise up and build focusing on eternal things when we are so overburdened with the physical things? And I'm not saying it's wrong to engage. We have to make a living. First Timothy chapter 5, I understand that. But until we get more serious about spiritual things, how in the world are we ever going to conquer the world for Christ? So let's think about it tonight. That means what John said in chapter 2, verse 15, 1 John, love not the world. Now that's an easy statement. It's not hard to quote. And actually it's not that hard to understand. Love not the world. I maintain tonight you don't have to know the Greek or be a rocket scientist to understand the tone of that comment. It's simply don't love the evil allurements of this world. Don't chase that. Don't, don't have as your primary motive and your thought the things of this world. He goes on to define those things in case we did not understand those. The love of the world consists of the pride of life, the lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, and John says all of these things will pass away. And if we love these things, the love of the Father does not abide in them. Now, if the love of God does not abide in us, pray tell how we would ever make it to the shores of eternity. How would we ever rise up and build and, and help strengthen the work of God if we don't have the love of God within us? Jesus said in John 17, they shall know why as your love one for another. So how can we answer the prayer of Jesus or rise up and build like we're running from Nehemiah if we do not have the love of God within us? So we have to divorce ourselves. Y'all want to talk about divorce? Here's what we ought to do is divorce ourselves from the love of the world. Put it away. Separate ourselves from it. Come out from among it, 2 Corinthians 6 and 17. Now that means in practical points, we have to prioritize the assembly and things of the Spirit over things like sports, over things like family. Family? That's a little too far. Well, Jesus said, He that loves the Father more than me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10 and 37. Here's the teaching love your family, but love God more. Love your family, but love God more. It's Thanksgiving. I've had this happen, I don't know how many times. Thanksgiving or around other holidays, family comes in. And they'll test you a little bit. We don't see y'all much. It won't hurt y'all. Just stay home. It's just one time. What you do in that minute tells them where your priorities are. Right? You're letting a person of the world, you're letting a person of the world tempt you and your faith, and you're prioritizing what they think is more important than what God said is more important. Let me ask you a question this evening. Could we as a people be converting more people to Christ? And could we be rising up and building if every member, as we spoke earlier, was fully invested and committed to the local congregation? If we prioritized correctly? If we truly loved God more than the world? If we were men and women of prayer like Nehemiah? If we understood and expected opposition and had the wisdom to know how to handle it? If we never quit working and advancing the cause, even when we are opposing what's wrong, many lessons can be learned from Nehemiah tonight. Let us, let us rise up and build. And we're speaking about the love of the world. Let me say this too. I want to say that many people in the world are confused. They don't see the difference between a Christian and and a world. They have difficulty. I mean, they know what we speak, but sometimes what we say, there is a large disconnect between the teaching and the practice. Let me give you an example. I've been in a lot of congregations holding meetings, and I go over to a track track, and on the track track, there'll be things against dancing and social drinking. The tracks are correct. But sometimes the members are engaged in some of the very things that the tracks teach against. Well, now, if you're a neighbor or a friend of a member of the church, 
and you know what is expected. And you've heard sermons, maybe, and you visited, and you know what the what the uh, Bible teaches. But yet you see the members of the local congregation behaving in an entirely inconsistent way. Then that disconnect is hard to swallow, and that's why the coin, this phrase sometimes. Well, I don't want to go down there because there's some what? Hypocrites. Now, brethren, let me tell you something. All of us have had some hypocrisy because we've all been guilty of sin. And sin, to some extent, is hypocrisy. However, I'm going to tell you all something. All hypocrites that fail to repent and obey the gospel will be in hell. Do you want to be in hell with them? I don't want to go to that church. You might be a hypocrite or two. Yeah, but we're going to preach and we're going to work and we're going to serve God and we'll deal with the hypocrite. But if you stay out of the church, if you stay outside of Christ, as your excuse, so-and-so doesn't live right, that makes you just as bad as the hypocrite. So they're both wrong. What do you mean? The person in the church is living like the world is wrong. And, and we don't try to cut, I know Rick doesn't, we don't try to cut slack. I, you know, I'm not a fan of sweeping things under the rug. So we teach the truth, and if our brethren are wrong, they're wrong. And I promise you, we will deal with them fairly. But if you're outside of Christ, and you're using one or two, quote, bad apples, as an excuse to stay out, you're not acting from wisdom, nor are you aligned with the scripture. Because let us rise up and build means we need every able-bodied person to come into the kingdom of God and to assist us in the greatest fight ever. We do need more men and women. So as well, the numbers aren't that important. Yes, they are because God reported it. Acts 2, 3,000. We'll serve God with eight people. We'll serve God with 80 people. But we would love to serve God with as many as possible because the more people that we can recruit and persuade to become Christians... Not only is your soul going to be saved, but how many more in future generations may be saved? Here's the saddest statement of the Bible, in my opinion. Or one of them. Judges 2 and 10. There arose a generation after them that knew not God, nor, nor the things which God had done, the works for Israel. Brethren, we have got to turn this generation around. The only way we're going to do that is by having lessons that are not only informationally sufficient, but motivationally. And the Bible does both. It is informationally and motivationally sufficient. Sometimes lessons are designed to inform. Sometimes lessons are designed to inform and to motivate, to get up and to be encouraged to do something for God. What have you done for him this week? What this week? Coming to services. While necessary and wonderful for your soul, there's more to living for Christ than coming to the assembling of the saints. Now, let us rise up and build. I want to have tonight a little bit longer than normal invitation. I want to pinpoint two or three things that I think really need to be said. And now, I don't know who it is. And, and frankly, none of my business, I suppose. But somebody, if they've not obeyed the gospel, I don't want you to think that anybody's picking on you because I don't believe in picking on people. I don't believe in calling undue attention to people because that's just not something that's really cordial or, or gentlemanlike. Not in the public setting. Uh, unless you were guilty of some immoral crime. I'm talking about a non-Christian. We don't want to embarrass a visitor or a guest or a non-Christian. But I do want to ask you some very personal questions tonight. And by the way, it's not just the person who has no way to the gospel. I want you to ask yourself, if you've already obeyed the gospel, ask yourself these questions. Because some people think that they're saved, and they never actually obey from the heart that form of doctrine. Romans 6 and 17. A man told me one time, he said, I was baptized. He said, my parents told me that I had to be baptized by 12. That's why you were baptized, because your parents told you you'd be baptized by 12? That's an unscriptural baptism. You don't bat you're not baptized because mom and dad tell you to. 
One child said, he said, well, I asked mom, and she said I wasn't old enough. He said, but, but I, you know, you have to be accountable. You have to be old enough to make a distinctive decision to obey the gospel. Well, I'm going to ask a question this evening. How would you feel? Any veterans here? I'm sure there are. How would you feel if someone dishonored the grave of a World War II veteran? It bothers me when people ridicule our vets and, and don't honor the men and women that sacrificed for our country. That really bothers me. There's no gratitude and no appreciation. Do you know when we fail to obey the gospel? We are dishonoring the grave of our Lord Jesus Christ. The sacrifice. When men fall in foreign lands fighting for our freedom, we ought to recognize their sacrifice and honor them. What about honoring Jesus who at the cross died for the forgiveness of our sins? Matthew 26, 28, I will pour out shed my blood for many for the remission of sins. Now he died that we might live, the scripture teaches. He who was rich became poor that we through his poverty might be rich, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. How have you honored his death? How could we not honor the one who gave it all? Could you imagine some young man here when we go off to war Sometimes they came back, they would have a service to honor the young men in the town in World War II that had fallen. What would you think about the people that didn't come to give their gratitude to the parents of that person? Folks, we owe Jesus a debt of gratitude. While we could never earn our salvation, we by faith can obey the gospel, and the Father recognizes that obedience as gratitude for the sacrifice of his son. I love this verse, Ephesians 4 and 32. Be ye kind and tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4 and 32. Tonight, I want you to think about and ask yourself the question. Have I honored the death of Jesus? Now, according to Scripture, the only way that I see that we can honor his grave, honor his death, honor his resurrection initially is after we have believed in his name and his deity. After we've repented of our sin, turn from it. After we've confessed his name, Acts 37, is to be baptized in water. You know why? Because that's the reenactment of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And when by the grace of God and the blood of Christ we're raised to walk in the goodness of life, the Father is pleased because His Son's sacrifice was not in vain. He didn't die in vain. It pleases God when people honor Christ's sacrifice. That's one reason you ought to think about becoming a Christian. There's another reason tonight that you ought to think about becoming a Christian. And that is to set the proper example to those around you that you love. Do you want your children, your grandchildren, your spouse, your the people that are the closest to you in this world? Do you want them to remember your legacy as one that did what was right? Or one that for some reason or another never came to Christ? They'll be talking about this long after you're gone. The preacher someday will have to get up and give words at your service. Someday when you pass. People will come over and discuss, and questions will be, you know, will be talked about. Don't you want to set forth the mindset that, look, I obeyed the gospel, and I helped Judges 2.10 turn that next generation back to God? I'd hate to know. I suppose the thing that would haunt me the most, beyond going to hell myself, the thing that would haunt me the most was to know that by my actions or lack of actions, by my example, poor example, or lack of example, that I was the reason that my children and grandchildren someday were pointing to, well, Grandpa never did obey, Daddy never did obey, so I don't think I'll obey. 
You need to set the right example. You need to be a man or a woman and do whatever is necessary that God asks you, not only to honor his sacrifice, but to help change the next generation and serve as a legacy for your family that you have, by example, set the correct pattern. There's another reason you ought to obey the gospel tonight, and that's to have your sins forgiven. Everybody in here, before we come to Christ, is a sinner unclean. Romans makes it very clear. All men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The ways of sin is death, Romans 6 and 23. And there's no need to look to another until we look introspectively within. All men are in sin outside of Christ. That have the right faculties and that are of an accountable age. We know that sin separates. And while we quote Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 many times, there's many other passages that speak to this besides that passage. Sin is a burden to people. Sin, when reigning in the heart of man, constitutes a most heavy, constant burden. Wouldn't you like to be free from the burden of sin? Wouldn't you like to be redeemed, bought back by the blood of Christ? God gave us life the first time, and he gave us his son to buy us back the second time. Wouldn't you like to have the eternal riches of his grace, even the forgiveness of sins through his blood, Ephesians 1 and 7? There's another reason tonight that you ought to obey the gospel. And that is in view of eternity. Folks, we set forth on one evening the title, There Are No Shortcuts to Heaven, There Is No Round Trip Ticket to Heaven. And that lesson is as powerful and as true this evening as when Jesus discussed it in Matthew 7. Where you spend eternity matters, brethren, friends and neighbors. I plead with you. I persuade you like Paul is attempting to persuade Agrippa. Don't do like Agrippa. Don't say almost thou persuadest me. Become a Christian in view of eternity. Heaven must be so beautiful. Heaven will be in the absence of sin and the presence of God. Heaven will be a place where we never grow old. Where, where our new body will be such that we can live forever in a state of eternal bliss. Hell will be such. Everything we said that the night is true, where the fire is not quenched. Hell is a place of outer darkness, the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place, the Bible says, where the word dies not. And the worst part about hell is the fact that your conscience, your inner man, will live eternally. And your mind your mind, the worm died not, lifted from Isaiah 66 and 24, spoken three times by Jesus, Mark 9, 44, 46, and 48, had the idea there is the eternal suffering of the conscience, which will bring back in your memory, the flood of memory, all the opportunities that you had to obey the gospel. You were so close, yet so far. There's another reason tonight that you ought to obey the gospel. You ought to obey the gospel To tell God in your actions how much you love Him. Some people profess love with their lips, but their lips are far from Him, Jesus said in Matthew 15. The only way I know, and our liberal brethren don't like to say this, I know it, but I can't help it, the Bible teaches it. The only way that I am aware of, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, in the New Testament, the only explicit way that a man can show his love to Christ according to the text, by keeping the commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. John 14, 15. First John, keep my commandments. And do you know the Bible teaches tonight in Acts 10 and 48? They were commanded to be baptized into the glorious name of Jesus. Baptism does not save you by itself. To that we all agree. But baptism, often spoken because it is the culminating point at which a man's sins are forgiven, as the gospel being reenacted as God's operation, man's faith in the operation of God takes place, Colossians 2 and 12. Those are only a few reasons tonight that you ought to obey the gospel. Will you please obey the gospel tonight? Will you help us to rise up and build right here in Nesbitt, Mississippi?
to build this congregation in the strengthening process to grow in spirit and in number, to teach those around us to really be involved in Titus 3 8, the maintaining of good works, to be unmovable and steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, to live for Jesus and his bride. These are some of the reasons that you ought to obey the gospel. The water is ready. The brethren are here to take your confession. Don't wait the last chance of the invitation. If you need to be baptized into Christ Jesus, do tonight what you should have done a long time ago. Tell God you love him by your actions, by faith obeying his will. And thank him tonight when you go home that he spared your life this long in his patience to allow you the opportunity for your heart to get tender enough to honor the sacrifice of his son. Come as we stand and as we sing. There's no the throne of God. Do you know the invitation?